Hello and welcome to the On Stage Colorado podcast. I'm Alex Miller, and with me, as usual, is Colorado arts reporter Tony Tresca. Hey, Tony, how's it going? Good morning, Alex. It's going good. How about yourself? Oh, not too bad. It's uh, it's December seventeenth uh, as we record this on Sunday morning, and of course, we're heading. Uh, Christmas is only a little over a week away, so um, we'll be uh, looking at some of the. We've already spoken about a lot of the shows that are up for the for the holiday season, and some that aren't necessarily holiday focused, but are still going. So there's not a whole lot of new stuff to talk about today. Um, so that's why we thought we would we would talk a little bit about um, what's coming up in 2024. But uh, so but we still we're still in December. So we'll still review some of the latest shows that we've seen or reviewed on the website, as well as take a look at, at what, what's coming around coming up around Colorado the next few weeks. Uh, and then later in the podcast, we're going to have an interview with a stage manager. Tony, you did that interview with with Laura Mertz. Can you uh, tease it a little bit? Yeah. Uh, so I for the podcast, I had a fun conversation with CU Boulder's production coordinator for the Department of Theater and Dance, Laura Mares. Uh, she's a pretty, very, very experienced stage manager. She has over 25 years of experience in the industry. She's did over 800 performances of the off-Broadway musical Sessions. She's worked at various theaters like Steppenwolf and Call in Chicago, and then at a whole bunch of local theaters around Colorado. So we just have a really wide-ranging conversation about the differences between managing, stage managing a long-running show uh, like Sessions and doing something that's more of like a one- or two-weekend type of deal. Uh, and then we also talk about, dive into the uh, whether or not it's important to get a, an educational background uh, in order for this field and dive into that. So it's a it's a fun conversation. And then we also tease some of her upcoming projects. So stay tuned to the end to check that out. All right. Yeah, she's got a ton of experience. And uh, that is a really a fascinating job to be a stage manager because, uh, you know, they're definitely unsung heroes. Nobody, you know, uh, their, their audience will never know what they're doing, but they are the ones keeping it all together backstage and making sure that what's in front of the audience uh, looks good despite whatever chaos is going on backstage, right? Yeah, because we and it's a little known fact is like most of the time uh, after opening night is directors totally leave uh, the whole production. And so they kind of the keys get handed over to the stage manager. So in addition to that kind of like technical stuff, but in the rehearsal room, they also kind of have to have that artistic hat on as well once the director steps out. So it's a really unique role. That's right. Yeah. And then, you know, there are some shows that, you know, a lot of theaters don't even have stage managers, which, uh, you know, is just the way it is in, in some small community theaters, but they are certainly a nice, a nice luxury to have for, if you can, you can afford them. So, uh, all right, well, uh, we'll talk, uh, like I said in about some of the shows this month, but let's take a look at the 2024 lineup. And so, we were looking at some of the shows that uh, we're kind of excited about. Of course, there's a lot of shows that, you know, that theaters are doing that aren't new or, you know, uh, premieres or, or anything like that. So we, I, I wasn't going to talk about those so much, um, although there's plenty of great shows in that category as well. But uh, some of the ones that maybe uh, might be a little daring for uh, a particular theater or something that's new or something that at least I've never heard of, and maybe you've heard of some of these. And then there's some, there's definitely some brand new things. So, um, Looking into January, um, I noticed that the Open Stage Theater up in Fort Collins, and they perform at the Lincoln Center, they are doing Sweat. Uh, and that is a Lynn Nottage uh, play that won the Pulitzer. And uh, I saw it at the Denver Center, did it in 2019. And it's a it's a it's a pretty cool play. It's about uh, these workers in some sort of factory that are that are angry <laughs> about something. I'm I'm not I've not ever seen the play. I just saw Lynn Nottage's uh, product Clyde's that was here at the Denver Center. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and the only thing I know about this production is that Kenny Moten is going to be directing. Uh-huh. The ubiquitous Kenny Moten. The incredible. Ubiquitous and incredible, yeah. Um, so anyway, I think and Open Stage always does a great job. And uh, boy, it's been a while since I've been up to Fort Collins. Uh, and now that they've got, they've improved I-25 uh, up there, they've added some more Lexus lanes. So maybe it's not as horrible to get up there because for a while there, it was just awful. At uh, Betsy at Boulder Ensemble Theater Company, they're doing What the Constitution Means to Me. Uh, and this is a play by Heidi Schreck. 
And it's a it's a comedy about a woman reflecting on her past and present perspectives on the Constitution and the impact it's had on generations of women in her family. Uh, so that one sounds uh, pretty interesting. Are you familiar with that one at all, Tony? I, I, I am familiar with it. I, I, I watched it. There's a film's version of this production of the original Broadway play uh, that is available. I believe it's on Amazon Prime. So if you want to get like a little briefer on the play itself, I would definitely recommend checking it out. Heidi uh, Shrek is actually in that production, so you can kind of get a sense of her take on it. And then I've actually gotten a chance to talk with both Jessica and Mark over at Betsy about this production as well. And they're really excited about it. They've done this production with this team once before. Uh, and so, uh, but not here in Colorado. I was in another state. But so this will be the first time that they're doing it here uh, in Colorado. And they're going to do it once over in Denver. And then they're going to be remounting it later this year uh, in Boulder. So multiple chances to check it out. Yeah. Yeah. It starts at the Savoy, which is a everybody's like favorite little place to go see a show uh, in Denver. True West award winning space. That's right. I noticed that John Moore gave them a shout out. Um, and so, okay. And, and I have one other question about that. Is it, is it a comic show at all or a little both or what? I would say it is largely comedic because it's okay. kind of this woman riffing through the constitution. Uh, and it kind of gets a little bit serious. It obviously touches on, um, constitutional rights that are being infringed upon within our current uh, culture and society. Uh, but I would say largely it's very comedic. There's a, the whole show ends in a debate between her and this like fifth, fifth grader, I believe, uh, where they just flip a coin and debate um, a different amendment live on stage every night. Uh, so that's kind of the tone that it's, it's a, it's more of this lively assembly kind of feel. Okay. It sounds like something you, you could update weekly uh, these days. <laughs> In, indeed. <laughs> I wonder, yeah, I don't actually know if they, I don't know if they do, but are you de I know that the live per portion at the end is real every, every single time. So you could definitely throw in topical references to what's happening. All right. Another show coming up uh, is Cibolus at DCPA. Uh, it's, it's a, this is a comedy about three sisters taking an unexpected road trip from Albuquerque to Denver. And you and I heard the reading of this at the New Place Summit last year. Do you recall that show much at all? I remember liking it. Yeah, I... Or was it last year or the year before? I think it was the year before. It was, I think it was 2022. Okay, so you may not have been here for that one, but I, I remember... Yeah. Okay. So I have just have a kind of a vague recollection of it and, and enjoying it. And so I'm glad to see it coming back in a, in a full production. Well, I'm excited to check it out then. Um, and then at Curious Theater, they're doing, uh, and we're still in January here, Truth Be Told. So this is um, a play, it says, uh, about exploring the nature of objective truth and the ways we manipulate it. It's a world premiere focusing on a grief-stricken mother who seeks to convince a skeptical journalist that, her, journalist that her son has been framed for a mass murder. So that sounds very much in Curious Theater's wheelhouse, um, you know, uh, heavy, heavy stuff uh, like that. And they usually do a great job with it. Do you know anything uh, more about that one, Tony? No, this is the first time uh, I, I'm hearing about this. I know that the it's Christy Mentor Larson, who is the same director who just recently did their smash hit, uh, The Minutes, uh, is going to be directing this production. So I'm definitely interested to see uh to see the premiere um and was there any uh so i only had found a couple of shows in january uh, i know there's probably more were there any that stuck out to you that you wanted to mention before we move on to february which is packed with new shows i i guess i'll just throw out two things i think it's significant in january uh that's a, it is the it's not an opening per se it's actually the opposite it's a closing but it's a pretty big deal a BDT stage over in Boulder is going to be shutting its doors after nearly 50 years uh, on, and it'll have its final performance on January 13th. So if you, I'm not sure if there are tickets available for that, but there are some still sprinkling of tickets available throughout its final run. So if you want to get out there to check out uh, the theater before it's gone, I would definitely recommend you do it. Uh, and then the other one is, it's a newer production. It's by this group who I interviewed uh this earlier this year for uh, this piece called Willie Nicky that they did. It's the Agenda Theater is doing Mean Ghouls Twelfth Night. Uh, it's a sketch, a drag sketch comedy show over at Chaos Bloom. It's a post-holiday show. 
kind of envisioned as a group therapy session for those who are ready to move the fuck on from the holidays. So <laughs> if you uh, if you want to have some fun after the holidays, go over to Chaos Bloom and hang out with the Agenda Theater. All right. Well, moving into February. So the well, the big the big deal for uh, the Denver Center, uh, in addition to some of these premieres, is this this thing called Space Explorers. And this is more of an immersive thing uh, with through the off center branch of the Denver Center. Uh, it's called Space Explorers, the Infinite, and it's going to be at Stanley Marketplace, which is a uh, big, big food hall kind of place where they're currently staging um, Camp Christmas. Uh, and so this is uh, an immersive experience inspired by NASA missions aboard the International Space Station. So I'm just going to read the, the promo blurb here. On this unique journey, you will have access to never before seen 360 degree videos captured in space using advanced technology. Witness breathtaking views of Earth and gain a unique perspective into the daily life of astronauts through exclusive encounters with the international crew. So uh, that sounds really cool. And I think it's going to be sort of like Camp Christmas where you, you know, it's not like a performance every night. It's a, it's an ongoing series of entrance times that you would go to check it out. So uh, I think a lot of people are excited about that one. Um, and then uh, another premiere at the Denver Center that came out of the New Play Summit is Rubicon. Uh, and so this is a true story based on the career of Betty Thorpe, one of history's most effective spies. And, and Tony, I do think this was read last year, right? Do you remember it? I don't remember that. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Um, you know, the thing about the New Play Summit is that, you know, we're not, we're, you, know, you know, they ask us not to write about these things because they're not done yet. So, so they don't get as imprinted in my mind as if I had written a review or same for you. I'm off the hook. It's also 2022. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So my, my bad. I, you know, I've, I have no sense of time anymore. So anyway, but yeah, I do remember this show and I, I feel like I remember it being kind of funny, but, um, We'll, uh, we'll have to the see. internet tells me that it was the audience favorite award at the 2022 Colorado uh, New Play Summit Awards. Uh, so over in Golden at the um, Miner's Alley Playhouse or the Miner's Alley Performing Arts Center, uh, they're doing a show called A Jukebox for the Algonquin. Uh, and this is actually this is a, a March show. I skipped ahead by accident here, but I'll just say it anyway. This is a, a Paul Stroyley uh, play that Len Matteo was directing, and I love the description of this. It's uh, the contemporary community room at the Placid Pine Senior Care Center could really use a jukebox, uh, and so they get these uh, a small band of former Brooklyn and Bronx residents hatch a plot to prove that aging is not a New York state of mind. It's a funny, heartwarming story. Uh, sounds sounds like a lot of fun, uh, and I don't know. Uh, how how old that play is but it's a it's a very new play it actually uh, i was just talking to lynn and lisa about it for an, a piece i'm working on about miners alley and this is so it's a regional premiere paul is actually the playwright is actually going to be coming to golden to help work on it wonderful uh, this just had its premiere it, uh, recently at i believe it's jeff daniels theater uh it's the purple purple rose i want to say it's the, the Jeff Daniels, the actor. He has his own, he has his, this theater that he does, produces work at. And it just had its world premiere there. And so now it's coming to Golden. Uh, there, so the whole team over there is very, very excited about it. Okay. So that one, it will be at Miner's Alley in March. Uh, going back to uh, February, I was just going to mention that we have the Colorado New Play Summit, February 24th and 25th. Uh, so this is, uh, if if you're not familiar, this is a, they usually have four or five new plays that, that they've got as readings. Uh, and it's really fun. You get to go, uh, you, you know, you get to see all of them because they stagger it over, over two days um and there's you know there's audience like uh you can fill out these sheets that kind of give you know to help uh, give give the playwrights and and the directors an idea of of what what you thought of it and then you know if the playwrights are are lucky it gets to be a full production like Sabolas and rubicon are after uh, two years of of um of work uh, from the 2022 New Play Summit. So uh, there, are, there are tickets available for the public there. There's not a ton of them available, but it's a ton of fun. So um, also at the at the Ellie Calkins Opera House, they're doing a Jekyll and Hyde Ballet, which I thought sounded pretty interesting. Um, and then over also in Denver, the I'm, gonna, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. The Nakarima Society requests the honor of your presence at a celebration of the first their first 100 years. And the Firehouse Theater is doing that. And uh, I don't know anything about that, but that's one of those titles where it's like, oh, man, how am I going to fit that into my promo material? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely going to have to shorten that one for the headline. 
Yeah, the Nakarima Society. Um, Firehouse has been uh, on fire. They've been doing a lot of great productions lately, so I'm curious to see that one. Um, and then down in the Springs, the Springs Ensemble Theater Company is doing something called Annapurna. Um, I feel like I maybe have heard of this before, but it's a two-character play by Char White, and it centers around Ulysses and Emma, a divorced couple who reunite after 20 years apart, set in a cluttered trailer in the Colorado Rockies. Uh, so it sounds like a little bit of a, a relationship uh, uh, kind of a one of those uh, pressure situations uh, in a trailer in Colorado. So local angle there. Another one I just wanted to mention was uh, this, this is a play that's uh, that's actually been done before, but it's called Clink Clink, and it's from the Two Cent Lion Theater um, Company, and it's just such a neat little play. And, they, and they've when I saw it, it was in this teeny tiny little theater on the DU campus, and now it's going to be in the People's Building, so they can potentially reach a bigger audience. So yeah, and this one's very exciting too because it's the start of uh, Two Cent Lions. Uh, residency season at the people's building they are going to be there there for 2024 they are there the people's buildings resident theater company so they're producing i believe it's four ish works throughout the year uh, and so this is kicking their season off strong so uh interesting thing about two cent lion there there uh, you know it was some du students that started it. kevin douglas who was one of the founders and also who was the, the playwright of, of clink clink and some of their others left uh he he had a really cool opportunity out of state uh somewhere so i'm not sure uh if he's still writing plays for them, do you know? Yeah, he's, I mean, he is still their resident playwright. He is in London, I believe it is, for the for, for the program he's attend he's a part of at the moment. Uh, but he is still actively involved. I still see his name on all the press releases that I get. Uh, he's and he's still communicating. So I, I it seems like he's still pretty invested in it, uh, even though he got a opportunity in London. Well, I, I love Two Cent Line. It's just a, a passion project by some some young people, and you know their focus is on. Uh, queer stories uh and they just do a great job of, of putting it together it's it's kind of like sort of like uh you know shoestring theater at its best um also uh coming up at the arvada center um this one is called natasha pierre and the great comet of 1812 and this sounds really cool so i'll just read this one electro pop meets war and peace in this musical extravaganza that transforms the black box theater into a russian dinner club with immersive seating for an unforgettable theatrical experience so that sounds like fun i want to i want to go to that yeah me too i'm super excited i i know that brian malgrave who i interviewed recently about Cinderella. He was briefly, he briefly teased in our conversation some of the work that he's doing on this production, and they are transforming the Arvada Center as uh, uh, black box space. So they're doing this musical in that space so that they can convert it into an immersive kind of ex style seating so that the actors are going to be playing instruments in the audience all around you, telling the story of war and peace uh, in this kind of way that I guarantee you that you have never heard of before. <laughs> have you ever read War and Peace, Tony? I have never read War and Peace, but I have listened to Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812 soundtrack many times. So I know uh, this 70 pages that it's adapting very well because it's not all of War and Peace, Mark you. It's only like a very, very small, small section of it. I think I only know one person uh, that, who's read War, War and Peace. Um, oh, so. yeah? Oh, yeah. It's just like this famous, you know, doorstop. Not, it's not you either, I'm guessing. No, I, you know, I was trying to read the Brothers Karamazov a, a while ago, and I still have the a hard copy of it. Of course, that's, that's Dostoevsky and more in pieces Tolstoy, but, you know, same same wheelhouse, I would say. And uh, boy, they're they're tough sledding. It was written for a different kind of audience, you know, that had like a long, a much better focus, uh, attention span than, than people today. I, I don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah. So anyway, so that will be at the Arvada center in their, uh, black box. And then up in Fort Collins again at Bob blue, they're doing something called the open house. Uh, we're still in February here and this sounds pretty heavy cycles of familial abuse and trauma are examined through by, through by both participants and outside witnesses, the family's broken. Can it be fixed? Uh, so that's coming up. Uh, and then at the Aurora Fox, they're doing art. So this is certainly not a new play. Um, I've heard people say they love art and some people say they hate it. And I honestly, I've never seen it. Have you seen art? I've never seen it, but I was talking with, uh, I was talking 
I'll I'll let them remain anonymous, the former arts arts and culture reporter. Uh, And then when I was talking about art, they had such a visceral reaction to it. (laughs) So (laughs) in negative, uh, negative reaction to it. They just hated the writing. (laughs) So which made me even more intrigued to see it. I'm like, what? Yeah. But it did provoke this strong of a reaction. I know. (laughs) It did really well. I mean, everybody had heard of it. It was like, you know, one of the most famous plays there for a while, a couple of what... (laughs) 20 years ago it's a hugely awarded play yeah it's like a very very widely celebrated so uh, i i'm i'm curious i i i'm curious to check it out and see why aurora fox is doing it now yeah well it's it's always fun to uh, take plays that are controversial and put them up again uh, especially if it's a couple decades on and see how they do for for a new audience so um also at our our favorite contemporary ballet company wonderbound they're doing something called awakening beauty and uh, we're back to uh russia artists here it says what if tchaikovsky slept for 100 years and then started a synth pop band in the 80s well what that's a great premise uh it's a retelling of sleeping beauty so uh there's there's um wonderbound does wonderful wonderful work over there we just saw their their show icy hot i think and uh this weekend but uh yeah we really enjoyed seeing that yeah and this one's going to be a back back to live music uh on stage with them they're taking the original uh, Sleeping Beauty Orchestra, and they are just completely deconstructing it for this new ballet. So, um, and uh, yeah, they they were another uh, uh, company that got uh, got a True West Award um, for um, the the show that they did with uh, guest. Gasoline lollipops. The Sandman. Yeah, which I didn't see. I wish I'd seen that one. That's uh, uh, you missed out. It was that was killer, uh, and it was the final show for one of their longtime uh, dancers. So it was really emotional as well. Cool. And then the last one I would mention is that Thunder River Theater Company up in Carbondelay, otherwise known as Carbondale, uh, and they are doing a Beckett play that I've never seen before. It's called Endgame. And I, that's a bold choice. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's not easy to get butts in seats for French existentialists, uh, you know, uh, like that. And so I don't know that play. Uh, are you familiar with Endgame at all? Not one of the Beckett's that I've read. Okay. So, uh, so that'll be up at Thunder River. So Missy Moore is the AD up there and she's, she's uh, making a bold move there. Uh, with that one. So I will try and get up there for that. Anything else in February you wanted to mention, Tony? No, I think that's okay. You kind of, kind of covered it all. Everything from those smaller productions to like the DCPA's new play summit that definitely looking forward to seeing. Okay. And I didn't have as much in March. Maybe you've got a few others. There are a couple that, that stuck out to me. A Big Fish at Open Stage. This one's based on the original novel. And then, of course, it was made into a uh, really cool, interesting film uh, back in the early 2000s. And I remember it really well because I was I was working in, in L.A. at the time. And I happened to be working at a at a magazine for a while. And when if you were any kind of journalist in the L.A. area, you get all these invitations to go to premieres. And a lot of times they're on the studio. So I remember going to the Sony the Sony lot uh, to see Big Fish with uh, with my son Austin, uh, and it's 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 a really interesting, curious story. So I'm, I'm I'd definitely be uh, intrigued to see what it looks like on stage. Uh, and then at the Town Hall Arts Center, they're doing one called Raisin. Uh, yes, this is an adaptation, a new adaptation of Raisin in the Sun. It's a musical adaptation over there. So uh, yeah, I, I'm interested to see what that kind of looks like and how they musical. Uh, that pl- very very famous play okay yep so it's, it's a soulful and inspiring musical about a proud black family's quest for a better life in 1951 chicago so uh that's a, that's an interesting one to check out and then also uh in march um the aurora fox is doing gem in the ocean so this is uh, about a young southerner in 1904 pittsburgh who meets an underground railroad conductor and is taken on a mythical journey of awakening. Uh, so that sounds uh, that sounds pretty cool. Um, again, that's a pretty lame comment. It sounds cool. Um, but uh, yeah, that does sound pretty interesting. And anything else in March that you wanted to mention? Uh, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll shout out what's uh, the, the big tour coming to coming that month over at the Denver Center. If you haven't seen Hairspray, uh, the, that tour is coming to the Denver Center, and that's always a fun one. It's a rock and musical, good, really smart lyrics, and so it, it's Hairspray. Yeah, I don't, 
I don't know that I've ever seen like a full on professional, you know, big ass Broadway production of Harris, but it's Hairspray. So that that would be cool to check out. So. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, a look around the state at some of the live theater coming up as we round what I guess is third base uh, for the holiday season and head into the new year. So hang on. We'll be right back. The Onstage Colorado podcast is supported by Town Hall Arts Center, whose production of Urine Town runs January 26th through February 25th. The three-time Tony Award-winning musical comedy is set in a collapsing urban metropolis where a 20-year drought has led to a government-enforced ban on private toilets. The citizens must use public amenities owned and operated by an evil corporation that profits by charging admission to the most popular seats in the house, so to speak. A hero will rise, a revolution will be sparked, and an unlikely love story will unfold. Get tickets at Town Hall artcenter.org. The Onstage Colorado podcast is sponsored in part by the Boulder Ensemble Theater Company, Betsy, whose new production of Holly, Alaska features a merry band of community theater players who've been keeping the tradition of an annual holiday pageant alive for 119 years. But due to recent cutbacks, the town council has decided this year's show can happen. So in a last ditch effort to save the pageant and the town itself, the actors pull out the stops in this heartwarming tale of love, connection, and holiday revelry of the goofiest kind. Holly Alaska runs from December 7th through the 31st at the Dairy Arts Center in Boulder. Get tickets at thedairy.org and learn more about the show at betsy.org. Okay, welcome back to the Onstage Colorado podcast. I'm Alex Miller, and I'm here with Tony Tresca, and it's time for our weekly peek into some of the shows you can see on stage right now around Colorado. And Tony, I have to say, I was... I was off this weekend. I did not see any theater. Oh, I saw. Um, I, <laughs> uh, yeah, there just wasn't anything on my calendar. I went to see um, last night. Andy and I, uh, my son Andy and I, went to go see the new uh, Studio Ghibli movie, oh. The Boy and the Heron, uh, which was great. Uh, as usual, those are always uh, fascinating movies to see did you guys see the sub with subtitles or the dubbed version with like robert pattinson and Willem defoe and all that yeah we saw the we saw the dubbed one so yeah it had florence Pugh and yeah christian bale was in it and i i know i couldn't uh and mark hamill of course whose voice is over he's like in anything involving voiceover there's usually a mark hamill uh credit in there uh but uh yeah really really uh fascinating film and uh, one I would definitely definitely recommend not as you know it's a little it was a little more approachable I guess than some of Mirazaki's other films that can be like really heavy sledding like uh, Spirited Away or um, so so anyway so that's all I saw this weekend but uh, uh, our reviewer Eric Fitzgerald was out at Christmas Carol at the Denver Center which is you know a perennial every year uh, kind of thing they do have a few new cast members I think they have a new Scrooge this year and uh, a couple other ones so that is running through December 24th and if you haven't seen it definitely check that out it's a great it's a great production and if you have seen it or if you haven't seen it in a few years definitely go check it out also uh not a holiday show Matilda the musical is at Town Hall uh through the the 31st of the month and that uh, Eric just couldn't say enough good things about it so it's a great it's a great show to start with. And I know, Tony, it's one of your faves, but uh, Town Hall apparently did a really nice job with it. And, you know, it's always key to find your Matilda. So apparently the young the young woman or young girl uh, did a great job. Yeah. Ellie Pink, she'd played it once before uh, with over at the Pace Center uh, with Sasquatch Productions uh, in their production of Matilda Jr. So she got, a, she got experience with the role and she just, she loves the book so in our conversation with her. So that, uh-huh. I imagine that makes a difference. Oh, wow. You know, I, I guess we mentioned this earlier, but yeah, I saw that production, but that must have been three years ago, maybe. She was uh, quite a bit younger. What else? Um, a couple of these shows, there's a lot of stuff that's wrapping up this weekend. We had a review of Granny Dances to a Holiday Drum, which is a Cleo Parker Robinson dance theater show they do every year, uh, which is uh, something that uh, our reviewer, Jamisha Lenhoff, said really is something you should make part of your holiday tradition. It's just very, very different than a lot of the other uh, shows out there. And then uh, a, a kind of a Colorado themed, not Colorado theme, but Colorado uh generated, I guess, Motones and Jersey's Holiday Hi-Fi, which is kind of a seasonal adaptation of Kenny Moton's uh, Motones and Jersey's show that uh, apparently is a ton of fun. So it's got like the like the um, 
you know, the Motown guys and the, and the Jersey guys, like the, who were the Jersey guys, like Frankie Valley, the four tops or whatever they were even before my time. Um, but, uh, apparently it's a, it's a lot of fun. So anything else, Tony, anything, any last things to mention? Yes, I actually have one new opening to mention. Uh, so I was at the opening night of the world premiere of FOMO, formerly Mormon, over at Benchmark Theater. It's a written uh, and starring local uh, comedian, artist, Frankie Lee, and it's describing his experience as a as an 18 year old, he kind of, as a joke, joined the Mormon church. Uh, and then this chronicles his very not a joke experience in the church and the kind of intense whirlwind that that was. He gets visited by this gay angel who's supporting him along the way. And it's a, it's a, for how heavy some of the subject matter gets, it's a very, very funny uh, show. It works in bits about how Ancestry.com is owned by the Mormon church, which is, yeah. that's a fact. Uh, they and he and Frankie talk, described it. That this was insane. That the, when you register for the Mormon Church, they log like the Mormon Church will log all of your dead family members as former Mormons into their system. Uh, so if you do, maybe don't use Ancestry.com unless you want your family to be counted as part of the Mormon church for their records, which uh, that's just part, one of the insane details that this show uh, does. And it's very, very thought provoking, very funny. Uh, it's running through December uh, 30th over at Benchmark Theater. Okay. Yeah. And it's uh, Benchmark is not known for their comedies. So uh, if you get a chance to get a few laughs at Benchmark, that sounds great. But I didn't know that about Ancestry.com because my wife is super into that. And uh, I always cringe at the, the cost of it. It's like $170 uh, twice a year or something. It's not a cheap uh, subscription model. Uh, but I didn't know that all of my, my ancestors were being characterized as Mormons because all of mine were you know, uh, Irish Catholics, mostly from the New York area. So, yeah, I, I had to ask Frankie after the show, I was like, is that, is that bit true? And Frankie was like, yes, that is one of the weird things that is true about the Mormon church. And I was like, okay, wow. fair enough. Uh, and it was actually started over at the Denver fringe. Uh, I won the audience, like the Denver fringe award of the, over the summer. And speaking of Fringe, I actually ran into the head of Fringe, Ann Sado, over at a different event I was at. I was at this rap performance, spoken word show uh, called Integration about the launch of this uh, by Jack Dawkins, who is this spoken word poet who was releasing an, uh, a rap album about his ayahuasca trip uh, in Costa Rica, I believe it was. And uh, so it's a re that was a really incredible performance. I definitely recommend you check out his music. And I believe he's going to be redoing his, the performance aspect of it where he shares his story in addition to his music again. So check out his website for more details. Oh, wow. That sounds very interesting. Ayahuasca. I had a friend who did one of those. She went to South America and did that whole thing. And I, I know I was just reading the other day, like there were some football players that are doing it. Apparently it's like the cool thing to do. I guess it's all the rage. <laughs> I, I can't personally say I have to, uh, I've taken a South American ayahuasca trip. But, uh, <laughs> I guess if somebody wants to sponsor it for the podcast, uh, I wouldn't say no. <laughs> all right. Well, um, we are going to uh, hear your interview with Laura Mares, who was on our podcast in 2019. So it'll be great to catch up with her again. So here's the interview. Hey, Laura, how's it going? It's going great. Thanks, Tony. How are you today? I'm doing well because I'm excited to be chatting with you today as a part of the On Stage Colorado's ongoing series where we take listeners behind the scenes with the technical teams who make theater possible. My guest today is CU Boulder's production coordinator for the Department of Theater and Dance, Laura Mares. Hi, everybody. So happy to be part of this community and part of this wonderful podcast and get to chat stage management. Ooh, um, we are so excited to have you on and to chat stage management. Yeah, you were. that's kind of the technical area that you are bringing into the fold here. Can you share with listeners what initially drew you to the field of stage management and what's kept you passionate about it for after 25 years in the industry? 
Yeah, you know, I think like a lot of stage managers, I fell into it from being on stage. <laughs> um, yeah. I started out as an actor in high school. I did tons of musical theater, lots of plays, things like that, and was pretty sure that's what my career path was going to be going into undergrad. Um, and then I auditioned for that, you know, those first auditions, your first year in college and um, didn't get cast. And so I, I kind of was bumming around and trying to figure out how to get involved. And so I asked around and a professor suggested maybe I could assistant stage manage. And at the time I was kind of like, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Cause you know, in high school, it's like your teachers are probably doing a little more of that role. So um, I ended up an assistant stage manager on Taming of the Shrew, my freshman year in college and, above and <laughs> yeah, just a little one. Um, and I've just been doing it ever since. Um, and I think what really keeps it interesting for me is that there, every show is different. Nothing is the same. Even if yeah. you do the same show, it's going to be a completely different production. Absolutely. And I realize we may have jumped the ball uh, for our, obviously for everybody in the theater community, they know how important the stage manager is to every single production. They are quite literally central as, uh, and they run the show after the director steps out of the room. But for anybody who maybe doesn't know, uh, who is not super well versed, maybe in the backstage world, could you give a brief description of the role of the stage manager? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, the way I kind of like to explain it is it's kind of like air traffic control. There's a lot of things coming and going. And the stage manager is really the per person that is the communication hub. So, mm -hmm. you know, as you're getting going into a show, you're usually helping with auditions and getting actors cast in the show and then scheduling. It's a lot of scheduling. It's a lot of meetings and just lots of tracking of all of the information so that no matter what question is asked, in theory, someone on the stage management team should know. We can help. <laughs> yeah. So with over 800 performances of the off-Broadway musical sessions and your extensive work at regional theaters like Steppenwolf in Chicago, as well as various local Colorado theaters, can you talk a little bit about how your experience differs in managing productions at such diverse venues and what skills you picked up along the ways? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you do one show for a really long time, I think one of the tricks you know, and I talk to students about this too, is how to keep it interesting for yourself mm. and for your cast. Um, and when I, I got brought on to sessions, it was actually the second time they had done the show. Um, and so it was a new cast for the most part, but some returning folks from the original production. And so we were dealing with sort of blending that group of people. And as always, because we're all very emotionally dramatic, sensitive folks in theater, <laughs> there were some personality conflicts and we made some casting changes. Um, but ultimately, I think doing a show that runs that long prepared me for other parts of a stage management job I had done before. Like you mentioned, which a lot of people don't know, is that when a show opens, the director leaves. And so if you're doing a show that has a very long run like this, the stage manager also kind of serves as like an assistant director because you still have to maintain the artistic integrity of the show. So often you're giving artistic notes from time to time. Um, and, and usually if there was something that was substantial, I would ask the director or an assistant director that we had on the show as well to come back and just watch and sort of take their own notes. So usually that was every three or four months, or especially if we were putting a new cast member in. Because by the mm -hmm. time the show closed, we had three complete casts that could have done the show at any point because we had a bench of understudies and swings and all of those people. Because when you do eight shows a week for you know years, people need vacations, people have life things come up. So you need to have a good crop of folks. I even had a couple of subs, so I could take a night off here and there and know my show was being run well. Yeah. So I think doing a long running show really set me up to learn how to have kind of more of an artistic eye on my own shows and my own work. And also I got really good at delegating <laughs> and not being afraid of saying, you know, I'm going to take a couple nights off. I'm going to call one of my subs and see if they can come. And, and, um, it really started to teach me that even though our industry is often very kind of a grind culture, which we are trying to change, having options like that really helps people feel like, 
oh, I can walk away if I need to, and the whole world's not going to fall apart. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, I learned a lot, definitely, about different venues and and how to just manage a long show and a lot of challenging personalities. You know. And how would you say that kind that experience kind of differs working on a long running show with like sessions versus when you're doing more freelance kind of work that is maybe shorter runs, potentially like maybe a couple of weekends or maybe a month or two? I would say the big thing is that typically in a shorter run, I think by the time we all feel like we've gotten into the groove of the show, it's going to close. <laughs> yeah. So often with those shorter runs, it it is really fun. I, I, I actually prefer a shorter run. Like I was grateful for the two years of work, but it's, it's fun to just do it a shorter length of time. Cause you all, you really get to know the show together and we find different fun things for the actors to do on stage, still maintaining the artistic vision of the director, but really um, enjoying audience responses, things like that. And it, it just, um, because you know, it's finite as well. I think it makes you appreciate the process more and really dig into it a little harder. Mm -hmm. you, so you hold an MFA in stage and production management from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. How's your academic background influenced your professional practice? And do you have any advice for aspiring stage managers looking to pursue a similar uh, career or educational path? Yeah, um, I went to grad school about eight years after I finished my undergrad degree. So mm -hmm. I actually joined Actors' Equity Association, which is our professional union for actors and stage managers, right out of undergrad because a theater needed somebody and I had already been doing some work there. So I was out working in the field, but ultimately decided maybe I wanted a little more education and eventually I would like to move into educating others because I was just loving it. And every time I had the opportunity to work with a new young stage manager, it was so exciting to watch them fall in love with the work. And so I chose to get my MFA so that eventually I could be in a university setting. It took me some time to get there, but um, I think an MFA is really valuable and important and often absolutely necessary if you want to work in academia. If you don't, I think it's a very personal decision based on why you feel you need it. Um, the only reason I got it was, again, because I needed the piece of paper because I had already I felt like I'd had a pretty well versed career at that point. Um, and what I'd already been able to do before I went into grad school. But I think if you are a, a person who wants to teach, an MFA is crucial. If you are not, then it's a very personal decision as to whether you would like the further education. But I don't think it's required to have a successful career in stage management at all. Mm -hmm. Speaking of higher education, can you share some insights into the, your role as the production coordinator at CU Boulder's Department of Theater and Dance? What are some of your primary responsibilities and how do you support the students and faculty and their creative endeavors? Sure. Um, the big part of my role is pretty much if there is a theater or dance show in the tech process in the building, I'm probably there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I support our student stage managers very specifically as in their own growth and journey. And with some of them doing dance, especially is very new because a lot of our stage managers come in having done only theater and that's kind of what their plan is. Mm -hmm. But we really want to get them on both sides of the building because doing dance is a great way to broaden your horizons as an artist and just make you think about how you stage manage a little bit differently. It's a very different process. So I think it really helps broaden our students as far as how they think about collaboration and working together in a creative process. Um, so that's that's the big part of it, is I support student stage managers through that. I also serve on several committees. Um, most recently, I'm part of our faculty DEI committee, and I liaise with our student DEI committee. And so that's been a lot of hard but good work. Um, mm -hmm. We do all kinds of things. I also do things as basic as ordering spike and gaff tape supplies, which as we all know in theater are crucial for success. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. And so I'm glad that you have got that responsibility on lock. The students and faculty must appreciate you a lot. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we have to have what we need. Um, yeah. But a lot of my job is, is coordination and especially just people support, making sure folks have what they need. And at the education level, reminding our sweet students that it's important to eat and drink water and to make room for self-care 
and especially our young stage managers who are all very driven, wonderful, ambitious humans, also reminding them that it is okay to say, I can't come to rehearsal because I'm sick. You know, I think in our field, that gets hard for, for our younger artists because they have that mentality of the show must go on. But also, like, our health is important. So we all have to remember that it's okay to take a night off if you need it. The show will go on without you, I promise. <laughs> When it comes to the craft of stage management, what do you believe are the most important qualities or skills that a successful stage manager should possess or work to cultivate? You know, that, that's a great question. And because I talk about that with fellow stage managers and students all the time, I think some of the actually most important skills for stage managers are what most people would call soft skills. Mm. So really the ability to work with people mm -hmm. and listen well, read a room, just understand what's happening around you because there are a lot of nonverbal details and cues that can happen in a rehearsal room as well. So really understanding kind of what's going on, um, you know, actors by nature who we as stage managers generally work the most closely with throughout a process are just very, tend to be pretty emotional folks. Mm -hmm. And so it's a matter of paying attention and having that quick check-in if you feel like, something's off, you know, I always like to just say, Hey, is this something that we can chat about after rehearsal? Um, do you need some support? Things like that. So I think that's a big skill and sometimes hard to teach. I think some of the best stage managers are just folks who naturally have those abilities, but you certainly can learn and develop that. And then honestly, just being a human who is well organized and excellent at communication of all kinds. Yeah. A successful stage manager has to return an email or a text message or anything quickly to really stay on top of their project. So if you're a person who's like got 1,700 unopened emails in your inbox, you may not be a person who's going to be most successful stage managing. Um, you really have to stay on top of all of that to keep the show moving. That's, that's the key. It's like once that train starts rolling, it doesn't stop until closing night. So you have to be fully on board and committed. Yeah. Final question for you. What are three shows on your theatrical bucket list that you haven't been a part of yet, but you want to be soon? That's a great question. A lot of them are shows that are still happening on Broadway. So someday soon, I will hope that we have the option to do them. Fingers um, crossed. My yep. Um, one of my all time recent favorite musicals for sure is Hades Town. Mm. Um, I'm a huge fan of Greek mythology. And so I love the way that that show came together. Um, the whole team, the production team on that show was just fantastic. And the fact that it was very largely female led is super exciting to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I would love to do Hades Town. Um, one of the other shows that I have always loved, but never had the chance to work on is actually a classic musical. If anybody wants to produce Brigadoon anytime soon, let me know. I know it gets done. I've seen it several times, but never had the chance to work on it. And it's a family favorite. So I would love to do that one at some point. Um, so call me anybody if you're producing it in Colorado. Um, and then I think the last one actually is a show that, again, I have loved forever and ever and seen many times. But um, I would love to do a production of Falsettos. Ah. which is a smaller cast musical that's a little older, but it was re revamped on Broadway uh, just before COVID. Um, mm -hmm. And Christian I think it's Borrell a really... In it. Such a good production, yeah. Fantastic. It's a really lovely show. So if anybody wants a small new musical to get hooked on, I highly recommend giving it a listen. But it's, um, it's a really and... great show, and I love it. So I'd love to do it. So give Falstettos a listen and then give Laura a call. <laughs> exactly. That's the order. Yep. <laughs> Are there any upcoming projects or productions that you're particularly excited about, either at CU Boulder or elsewhere in Colorado, that our listener that our listeners should be on the lookout for? Yeah, actually, there are two I can mention. Um, we yeah. have a really exciting spring season at CU Boulder with a variety of theater and dance, but I think our biggest challenging show is going to be the play that goes wrong mm. which will be going up in april in the newly uh revamped row green theater so folks should definitely come check that one out check out the cu presents website for tickets 
Uh, we were already in process. We've already had a read a read through with our design team to really look at how the show needs to work and be safe. And if you don't know anything about it, I'm not going to say anything more, but it's going to be really exciting. Um, and this summer, I have the privilege of working again with my dear friends, the Catamounts, mm. on a new world premiere piece called Impossible Things, which will happen um, in Centennial at uh, the Museum of Outdoor Arts right next to the Fiddler's Green venue. So it'll be a fully outdoor immersive piece of theater. Um, and I can't tell you a lot about it yet because the script is actually still in process, but mm -hmm. it's going to be a lot of fun. And if anyone hasn't seen work by the Catamounts, it really will adjust your perception of what art can be as far as what different things can come together to create theater because they are truly creative, wonderful folks. So I highly recommend that. And that will run end of May through um, mid-June down at Centennial. Catamounts.org. You can grab tickets for that there. Ah, so check out the CU Boulder's uh, Theater and Dance, uh, CU Presents website for more information about that entire season and then the Catamounts as well for their production that's going to be coming kind of uh, later and closer to the summer months. Well, thank you so much, Laura. Your journey in stage management and contributions to the theater community are truly inspiring. And it's just been a delight to talk with you on the podcast today. Thank you so much, Tony. I'll see you around soon. See you at the theater. Right, well, that's it for this week's episode. Thanks so much to Zolara Maris for coming on to talk about stage management and uh, for Tony to, to help out with all of these shows coming up, not just uh, in the end of 2023 here, but looking into 2024. Uh, so we're going to take the next few weeks off for the holidays, uh, not only because it's the holidays and Tony will be out of town, and, uh, but also because there's just not a whole lot of theater that's new you know it's just every anything that's playing has already been up and it's all mostly the holiday shows uh, running through but we will be back uh, on january 7th to look at what's fresh and new in the new year so um i was just looking at uh, some of the you know stats for the on stage colorado podcast so uh i restarted it back in february uh, after kind of a hiatus there for a while uh, but since we started it back we've had a, an amazing list of guests from all corners of the colorado theater scene we've had over 1700 like plays uh, you know it's not exactly the daily uh, or serial level but uh, you know we're whatever we do it because it's fun and uh, we do have some people that have given us really good uh, feedback on it they really enjoy it. for fun and to keep you guys informed there's a there's a lot going around there's a lot going on in the state in colorado so we just love to help you guys parse through it all that's right. So so anyway, so we will see you in 2024. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio stuff and uh, give us a review or a couple of stars and let other theater lovers in your life know about us. And of course, be sure to check out all of the reviews, news and other podcast episodes in the full statewide theater calendar at onstagecolorado.com. I'm Alex Miller. I'm Tony Tresca. And we'll see you at the show. <laughs> <laughs>